I'm Lee Fennell and I teach here at the law school. I'm very excited to be part of this event celebrating the legacy of Earl B. Dickerson. Uh, one of the classes I teach is actually fair housing, so I'm especially happy and honored to be chairing this panel. Uh, breaking down barriers to fair housing is not just a core part of Earl Dickerson's legacy, but it's also a continuing and crucial society-wide challenge. So it's fitting, I think, to devote part of this conference to a conversation that's focused on the work of carrying forward that legacy and meeting that challenge. So I'm excited to be joined here today by three wonderful panelists. I'm going to uh, just very briefly introduce them. I could say much more, uh, but, I, but I want to be fairly brief so that you get to hear from them as soon as possible. Um, I'll, I'll go in the order in which we're, we're going to hear from them. Um, Lolly Bowen is a program officer with the Field Foundation. She was previously an award-winning reporter with the Chicago Tribune, and she now works with media platforms to ensure more nuanced, racially equitable coverage of Chicago and a fairer division of funding among outlets. Larry Wood is a supervisory attorney at Legal Action Chicago, which is a subsidiary of Legal Aid Chicago, and his practice focuses on housing and poverty law. He's also a lecturer in law at the law school where he teaches housing and poverty law. Um, we also have with us today, uh, Kate Waltz, who is a senior staff attorney at the National Housing Law Project. She's a national expert on federally assisted housing preservation, fair housing, crime-free and nuisance property ordinances, the Violence Against Women Act, and the intersection of the criminal legal system and housing access. So our conversation today is going to start by hearing from each of our panelists, and then we should have some time for uh, discussion and questions, um, including uh, questions from the audience. So, um, so uh, feel free to save up your questions, um, and you can also write to me through chat if you like. Uh, so Lolly's going to start us off with an exploration of the questions, what is fair housing? And how is fair housing lived or experienced? Lolly, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Lee. It is such a pleasure to be here. Thank you for the invitation, for having me. Um, and William Hubbard, I see you on the call for organizing this event, uh, which honors such a leader um, and iconic figure in our community who has been overlooked. Um, so I wanted to start off just kind of interrogating this idea or giving a definition of what is fair housing. Um, and I, you know, for this audience, I think you all know about the Fair Housing Act of 1968, but I'm gonna give some context and exploration of the history of that as well. Um, you know, when I think of fair housing, particularly as a journalist, I think about it being the ability to choose a community where you want to live without race, age, sexual orientation, and gender being a barrier to you entering a community. Now, we know that the Fair Housing Act of 1968 came after the civil rights struggle. Initially, the civil rights struggle was trying to break down barriers of segregation, but the Fair Housing Act uh, revealed to us as a country just how much housing and discrimination in mortgage loans, in um, landlords and who they could rent to, uh, in income levels was causing and continuing to promote this um, discrimination and this uh, just uh, in. Um, this separation and segregation among races, classes. Um, one of the things that is coming to mind is we saw earlier, this panel follows a rendition of um, Lorraine Hansberry's A Raisin in the Sun. And one of the things that Lena Younger, one of the characters in that play pointed out is the reason why they wanted to integrate into another community is because the quality of housing in the community that the, this African-American family lived in was so troubled. And so they wanted to leave the community that they were in so that they could access resources. Uh, as a reporter and as a journalist, some 50 plus years after the Fair Housing Act of 1968, what we have found is that uh, although legally the discrimination is not allowed, new barriers and new obstacles have emerged that continue to perpetuate an unjust and unequal system. Um, and so as a reporter and a journalist, I've examined this in looking at how, um, where housing voucher holders 
end up living, um, whether they end up in uh, racially segregated communities or if they get access to communities that are more diverse and that have more resources. Um, I've examined this through the lens of looking at where uh, poor residents end up living in proximity to fresh food, grocery stores, and libraries. Um, I've looked at it through the lens of how landlords have uh, erected ba barriers in order to filter out not just racially, but through gender and through income and isolate certain types of residents. Um, and so this is kind of where I enter the fair housing um, conversation. Um, and now I'll pass the baton over to, I guess, Larry. Uh, thanks. I look at it very much the same way you do, uh, Lolly. Um, I will say that at Legal Aid Chicago, we represent uh, individuals who are living in poverty. Uh, or otherwise vulnerable, and so I'm going to address the issue from that perspective. Uh, Lolly had talked about uh, voucher holders, and that's very often how we encounter um, fair housing violations. Just so you know a little bit, a little bit of background on the voucher program. Uh, there's a lot of subsidized housing, federally subsidized housing, uh, throughout Chicago. Uh, much of it is what we call hard units. These are in Section 8 project-based developments uh, or public housing. As you know, a lot of the public housing has come down. Uh, in the Section 8 uh, program, uh, a lot of contracts between the owners of these developments and HUD are expiring and owners are allowed to get out of the program. And as a result of this, what's called the Housing Choice Voucher Program is becoming one of the government's primary vehicles for providing affordable housing to low-income tenants. The way the voucher program works is that eligible families get a voucher. Um, it expires at a certain point. Before it expires, they have to go into the private housing market and find a suitable unit. And then the public housing authority that administers the program inspects the unit, negotiates a reasonable total rent with the owner. Uh, if the unit is found to be acceptable, if it passes the inspection, then the family will sign a lease agreement with the owner. The owner signs a contract with the public housing authority. The family gets to pay a reduced rent equal to a percentage of their income. The housing authority sends the owner monthly subsidy payments equal to the difference between the total rent and the family's contribution, uh, which is calculated by the public housing authority. That's a very basic overview of the program but there are thousands of families who participate in the program. The problem is that, and as Lolly pointed out, um, a lot of the low-income families who get these vouchers have trouble using them to move into what we call opportunity areas, areas where there are good schools and uh, good jobs and access to public transportation. Most of the voucher holders end up moving to racially segregated, um, economically depressed areas on the south side and the west side of Chicago. And it just perpetuates this fair housing problem that we've encountered. Part of the problem is that many owners do not want to participate in the voucher program. Uh, now, it's important to note that in Cook County, first in Chicago, in Chicago, then in Cook County, there is a prohibition against source of income discrimination okay, that protects voucher holders. The rental assistance they receive under the voucher program is considered a source of income. So landlords are not allowed to refuse to rent to somebody merely because they have a voucher. Nevertheless, there's a tremendous amount of source of income discrimination um, in Cook County, and many of our tenants suffer that. And uh, they are denied housing, uh, sometimes by landlords who say they don't want to get involved in the Housing Choice Voucher Program, and other times by landlords who are a little more sophisticated and come up with um, a reason they don't want to rent. Maybe they say that uh, the uh, tenant's credit score is not high enough, or they come up with some other reason. But a lot of our uh, work is focused on attacking this type of source of income discrimination. Um, there's so much to say about this, and I'm trying to focus on just the most important parts. Um, 
another reason that it's difficult for voucher holders to move into what we call opportunity areas is because the rent in those areas are too high. And the public housing authority has these payment standards that they use to determine uh, how much money they're going to pay uh, as the total amount of rent for a particular voucher holder. And very often those payment standards just um, don't allow somebody to move into a neighborhood that is not racially segregated, that is not economically depressed. Also voucher holders find it much easier to move into these neighborhoods on the west and the south side. So it's really a very difficult problem, but I think that's one of the main problems facing uh, Chicago in the context of fair housing. Um, I'm not sure how much more time I have, and I don't want to cut into uh, Kate's time at all. You, you, you have a little bit more time if you'd like to. Okay. I, I was curious if you could say a little bit about how the kind of structure of the program and the fact that there are often long waiting lists to get a voucher and then time limits for using a voucher, how those kinds of pressures might um, lead to, might, might sort of exacerbate some of the, some of the issues. Well, the waiting lists um, to get a voucher are incredibly long, and they're closed in Chicago right now. You can't get on the waiting list, but there are thousands of families on the waiting list. And then once you get to the top and you get your voucher, as I had mentioned uh, before, the voucher term expires after a certain period of time. You have to locate housing before the voucher term expires. If you don't, then you lose your voucher. And it's just given to the next person on the list. And that also forces people to sometimes um, move into neighborhoods where there are not many opportunities. So uh, it's, it's a problem, or it's a program, I should say, that has a lot of potential. But in the way that it's administered, um, it's often just exacerbating this uh, problem that we have of segregation in, uh, in the city. And it's very hard to address. Uh, there are a lot of other ways that our agency tries to address fair housing issues. Uh, we represent many tenants uh, with disabilities who are facing eviction uh, because of a lease violation directly related to that disability. Um, and you are under the Fair Housing Act allowed to request on behalf of those tenants a reasonable accommodation if that will allow them to preserve their tenancy. We do a lot of that work. Uh, we do a lot of work on behalf of tenants who are survivors of uh, sexual assault and domestic violence, and that's another fair housing issue. Uh, Kate Walls, who's about to speak soon, did a lot of groundbreaking work in that area um, and helped uh, enact uh, programs that we can rely on when representing uh, survivors who are facing eviction because of their status as a survivor. Um, the last thing I'll say is that there's a very important uh, duty that HUD has under the Fair Housing Act to affirmatively further fair housing. And we have also relied upon that. And I'll very briefly describe one case in which we used that. It was a case that we filed several years ago against the Chicago Housing Authority on behalf of what was called the Local Advisory Council, a tenants organization at the Cabrini Row Houses. As many of you probably know, all of the Cabrini high rises came down, but there were uh, many row houses. There were 568 row houses. And the original plan for these row houses was to rehab them and maintain them as public housing, which would have been great because Cabrini's, you probably know, is right in the middle of an opportunity area. But then the Chicago Housing Authority decided, no, we're going to turn the row houses into a mixed income development where we're going to set aside just 30% of the row houses for uh, public housing residents. And we are going to give other people who could have lived there in that opportunity uh, neighborhood, vouchers. But we knew that the tenants who received the vouchers were going to move to the west and south side, to these racially segregated, economically depressed areas. So we challenged CHA's plan and said that they were violating their duty under the Fair Housing Act to affirmatively further fair housing. And after two years of litigation, it led to a very good settlement in the creation of more affordable housing in the opportunity area but I feel like I'm cutting into Kate Walls' time and I know she has a lot to say, uh, so I will stop here. Thank you so much, Larry. Um, so we'll, we'll turn it over to Kate at this point um, for her perspective. Thanks, Larry. And I'll just uh, say that almost 20 years ago, uh, I was part of a lawsuit that was filed against the CHA challenging how their voucher program 
um, where they were moving families at that point in mass from public housing into the voucher program was immediately resegregating them into black and Latinx neighborhoods. And if you look at the patterns of the voucher program now, little has changed, little has changed. So I wanna step back for a minute and really then talk about segregation in Chicago. Um, I don't think I need to say it to this audience, but we, will, we need to dispel the notion that segregation in Chicago is by choice, um, as opposed to engineered by design and decades of federal, state, and local policy. We know that a person's zip code has a huge impact on their life outcomes, and we see it in real terms in the city. It's a lack of access to reliable public transit, to quality public schools, to employment, to public services, to food, and it compounds their exposure to environmental harm. There are remedies to segregation and its intended harms, um, and they need to be focused, however, though, on both what Larry and Lolly have talked about, which is to support families' choices to move to more integrated, often called high opportunity neighborhoods, but as well to build up investments and resources in those communities where Black and Latinx families are living now. They should not be forced to uproot as the sole remedy, which has so often been the case in many of Chicago's policies and the CHA's policies. As well, efforts have to be made to reduce displacement so that when neighborhoods do finally receive the long overdue resources that they're entitled to, these longstanding members of the community are the beneficiaries of that redevelopment and can stay. The fight over the Obama Center led by Southside Organizing Together for Power is a great example of supporting redevelopment while ensuring that Black families can stay and benefit from it. Uh, the fight for the return of local mental health centers is a similar effort that will improve the communities where Black and Brown families live. So what are some of the other things that could remedy segregation in Chicago? First, we've got to talk about the city zoning code. It's a huge driver of segregation. The power of the city's 50 aldermen and alderwomen to control what is placed in their wards by the power of aldermanic prerogative is abusive, if not illegal, and must end. It does not centralize the city towards a core mission of fair housing integration and equity. Rather, it leaves us with fragmented neighborhoods in a fragmented city. The zoning code's central present, premise at present is to preserve the character of the neighborhoods. Thus, it's very much focused on preserving single family home neighborhoods and very much opposed to the ideal of a balanced de development throughout each and every neighborhood. So an overhaul of the code is key. And it, through this, we can bar the type of nimbyism that we see latent in zoning decisions throughout the city that leads to the vast majority, as the city recently noted, of their low-income housing tax credit units being placed in Latino and Black neighborhoods. The current code also leads to other harmful effects, as we've seen with the General Iron case, where there is environmental dumping primarily in Black and Latinx neighborhoods. The city has said through its fair housing plan that it plans to conduct racial equity impact assessments in all aspects of planning and development. I think this is a great start. King County uh, in the state of Washington has done this for a number of years. And as long as the city is committed, not just to assessing the racial impacts of the decisions, but actually taking action relative to it, this could be a move in the right direction. And finally, we've heard recently about the inclusionary housing ordinance for the city, the ARO, um, or Affordable Requirements Ordinance. The city introduced a new version of this ordinance um, earlier, uh, I think Monday, actually. And it's very exciting. It does improve upon what uh, is currently in the ARO, but it falls short of key measures towards integration and to allowing opportunities for voucher holders to move into communities of opportunity. First, the uh, threshold right now still remains at targeting units, affordable units, at 60% of the area median income. However, data shows that the majority of Black and Latinx households that need affordable units are at or below 40% of the area median income. 
So if the city wants to claim that this is a tool for racial integration, it needs to modify the policy. The second thing is it doesn't prioritize the construction of family size units. And so what we'll continue to see without a reform of that policy is that the developers will take the sort of path of least resistance, which are the studio units and the one bedroom units. So I'm hoping this is the start, the city having a broader conversation along with its fair housing plan, but there's more that needs to be done. Thank you so much. Um, th thanks to all the panelists. So I wanted to um, let people raise hands uh, on, on, on Zoom if they, have, if they have questions that they'd like to ask or if they wanna put something into the chat. Um, and while we're waiting for people to, uh, people's questions to percolate up, uh, I wanted to ask each of the panelists if they could just, just briefly say what it is that they see as the, the maybe the, the biggest, uh, you can say what's the biggest challenge if you want, but, I, but I'm actually curious of what you see as being the, uh, the biggest reason for optimism. Um, if we wanna be optimistic and think about progress being possible, um, do we see glimmers of hope? Do we see something that we think um, could give us hope for uh, the, the future of fair housing? Um, Lolly, do you wanna start us off? Sure. And again, I enter this conversation as a journalist and a reporter, so I'm not necessarily doing an analysis of the policy. But what I will say is that one of the biggest challenges that I found as a storyteller and as a writer was compelling enough people to be interested in fair housing and in housing quality as an issue. Housing determines everything for us as people, right? It determines where we send our kids to school. Again, the access to food that we have, the access to education, a higher education, the access to libraries, and the um, access to transportation that can get us to and from work. So housing is everything. And we have a, a internalized sort of a ranking system that makes us feel that if we are comfortable, why should we care about people who are uncomfortable? Right. And so as a storyteller, it was always um, a challenge to compel an audience to feel invested in the well-being of everyone in Chicago and to understand that having affordable housing that was integrated throughout the city doesn't take away from communities that are more economically solid. It just continues to spread the benefits. Right. The lower income residents don't want to live in higher income neighborhoods just to be there. We, what we have found, uh, not just uh, anecdotally, but through studies, is that by putting residents in proximity to good jobs, in proximity to fresh fruits and vegetables, in proximity to good libraries and schools and transportation, is better for the well-being of us all. So how do we get more people invested in the well-being of everyone? Ali, you asked about where what what we should be optimistic about. Well, I think that currently the sort of backlash from this pandemic has pushed more and more people to be concerned about housing stability. And before for this pandemic, housing stability and access to affordable housing was a um, label that was placed on African American and Latino residents, that this was a concern for them. Well, now as we see communities destabilized by gentrification, destabilized by economic instability that has come along with this pandemic, I think more people are talking about housing security, about um, rental security, and uh, being able to keep a community community secure um, and stable despite the shifts in the economy. I think more people realize that their housing access and their own housing security is not as stable as they thought it was, right? That one worldwide event could come through and you, the person who had a good job, who had a well-paying job, who was on the upside of the economic model, can find yourself in a similar position needing subsidies and needing subsidized housing just as well. And so my hope is is that as a result, this will make housing and housing affordability and housing access an issue for all of us, not just quote unquote low income people. Thank you. Um, Larry. Uh, all right, I'll, I'll quickly go just through um, three things that I see as cause for optimism. One is that we have a new president and a new administration uh, who seems to be genuinely concerned 
about furthering fair housing. Uh, there was recently an article, I know I sent it to all of you, uh, just from April 13th in the Washington Post, about the fact that um, the Biden administration is trying to bring back um, housing discrimination rules, uh, rules against housing <laughs> discrimination that the Trump administration had gutted. Um, they were going, or they're in the process of trying to reinstate a 2013 rule that codified a decades old legal standard knowing, known as disparate impact. This is very important because it allows you to attack a policy that may appear race neutral on its face, but if you can show that it has a disparate impact upon protected groups, Latinx communities, African-American communities, then you can challenge it uh, legally. They're also trying to bring back a 2015 rule requiring communities to identify and dismantle barriers to racial integration or risk losing federal funds. So that gives me uh, some hope. Again, they're just in the process of doing this and we'll see how far they get. Uh, Kate had mentioned Mayor Lightfoot's uh, blueprint for fair housing. Uh, again, I think this is a very good start um, and uh, people are still able to comment on this blueprint uh, through May, uh, but that gives me uh, cause for optimism. And also I'd like to touch on what Kate said about the fact that um, low income tenants, um, most of whom are Latinx or African American, are often forced out of neighborhoods once the neighborhoods start to come back, once they start to gentrify. And they're often forced out through um, the eviction process. There are more than 30,000 eviction actions filed every year in Cook County. The vast majority are filed against low-income families, uh, many of whom have subsidized tenancies. And these families get evicted often um, in cases that should never have been brought because they cannot afford an attorney. Now, an agency like mine can provide free legal representation, but we take about 450 of those cases a year, and that's 1.5% of all the eviction actions that are filed. So one thing that gives me great hope are these uh, right to counsel initiatives, uh, sometimes called civil Gideon initiatives that have um, taken off. Um, I think a lot of people have heard about the successful program in New York, and I would love to see that um, modeled here in Chicago um, because it's very important to ensure that every person who's facing eviction has meaningful access to legal representation. Uh, and if you can't afford it, then that should be provided for free. And I think that if you start providing meaningful access to effective legal representation, then you'll have far fewer families who are being forced out of these gentrifying neighborhoods once they come back and once they become opportunity areas. So, um, stop there. Thank you, uh, Kate. Um, I mean, I both I echo what Lolly and Larry said. I think that through the pandemic, um, everyday people now are talking about the national eviction crisis and starting to see the millions of families that are at risk. Um, and there's going to be a cliff, right, of evictions um, because efforts have been made uh, to challenge the CDC's orders um, uh, preventing evictions and they're gonna be lifted and, and families will be um, uh, out on the streets if we don't deal with it. And so to have a national conversation about that for the first time, when folks like Larry have been in the trenches in eviction court for decades fighting this, hitting their heads against the wall, I think is hopefully the start of a broader national conversation. I'm excited about the Department of Justice um, who has said that they are pursuing an exclusionary zoning initiative where they wanna try to change the exclusionary zoning practices of state and local governments. I hope the city of Chicago is at the very top uh, of that list. I'm excited too about the Biden administration's commitment to increasing production of affordable housing. Clearly we have an unmet affordable housing crisis, but it disproportionately affects black and brown communities. Um, but it has to also be tied to inclusionary zoning. So we don't repeat the mistakes of the past. Thank you, Kate. 
Um, so uh, um, we are, we're open for questions if people want to raise their Zoom hand. I saw a, a question come in over our, our chat stream. So I think um, may, maybe, I'll, maybe I'll pose this to Kate because you were mentioning the aldermanic prerogative um, and the way that that operates. And so the question was, after the vote of installing aldermen into office, what's the best way to actually put pressure on this arm of government to address fair housing and, and, and zoning tactics? Um, is, is, is there some way to do that? Or maybe I know that um, Mayor Lightfoot was wanting to change the way that, that the sort of aldermanic, you know, sort, sort of diminish the aldermanic prerogative and change the way that, that business got done. Um, what, what do you see as kind of the, the avenues that are available there for reform? I think there's multiple avenues for reform, including an overhaul of the zoning code. Um, Mayor Lightfoot did um, have as an early executive order asking every um, city department to look to what extent aldermanic prerogative was being used. And unless they could point to a law that allowed them to use aldermanic prerogative, they had to remove it from their policies. So it did stop things like aldermen being able to block requests for affordable housing dollars from the city. Because prior to that, you had to get a letter of support from the local alderman or your application was considered incomplete. However, more needs to be done. Um, we, have, we are representing 10 community groups who have filed a fair housing complaint against the city of Chicago, challenging the continued practices of aldermanic prerogative and the use of the zoning code in a discriminatory manner. Ultimately, what would need to come from that um, would be this change in the zoning code. It could be similar to what they do for adult entertainment venues in the city, is that if the aldermen don't vote on the proposal, it's deemed approved. They could do this um, for affordable housing and higher opportunity areas. This has been a concept that the city has considered in the past. It would also be to improve the affordable requirements ordinance. Thank, thanks so much. Um, so I, I guess one thing that I would say, and, I, and I'm, I'm eager for more people out there to ask a question. Oh, wait, here comes a question. Um, I, I, will, I will go ahead and, um, and pose this one. Uh, it, it, this is a question about whether fair housing and uh, non-segregation integration, um, is it all connected to good policing? Uh, do police do better in integrated neighborhoods and in black or Hispanic neighborhoods? Um, does any, anybody on the panel want to speak to that connection? Uh, we know that, that segregation has, has many very harmful effects. Um, uh, would you like to speak to that, Lolly, maybe? So what I'll say is that I've not seen any studies that actually link policing um, to integrated neighborhoods, but we know that one of the byproducts of segregation is that you can easily then withhold resources from a community or direct heavy policing to a community, right? You can uh, militarize a community very easily by just pointing at Inglewood or at Austin or at South Shore because you know that there's a higher concentration of lower income African-American residents there. You know what resources are there and you know what resources that are not there. As Larry said, a lot of these residents are not accessing attorneys to fight evictions. They're also not accessing attorneys to fight uh, heavy policing or to fight discrimination that they are, get, are getting from the police department. Um, they're not able to file the proper complaints and go through the paper process many times because these are working people who work nine to five, work five to 10, and then come home and are oppressed in their own communities. So while I haven't seen any direct studies that link policing to a community, we can say that there's a backlash already it's easy to penalize a community when it's segregated, when it's isolated, when it's homogenous. Kate, did you want to add to that? I would just, I put in the um, chat Deborah Archer's article about uh, crime-free programs on local nuisance property ordinances, because her theory is that police are there, whether it's predominantly Black and Latinx neighborhood or a white neighborhood, to control the behaviors of Black families in, partic in particular. So I think you um, you see it sort of in that type of scenario where police are there um, to enforce, particularly against black renters, their behavior 
you know, from everything from trash in the yard to kids playing basketball on the street, you see the role of police regardless of the community. And in the case that I had uh, suing on behalf of residents for a, a nuisance property ordinances, it was the white neighbors able to use that ordinance to frequently call the police on their black neighbors, uh, most of whom were voucher holders. And so they would try both to get them evicted and to ensure that they lost their voucher. And the police were central to making that system work for the white community and to maintain white control. Yeah. <laughs> and also think about the contract that the Chicago Police Department has with um, CHA to provide special policing services to public housing communities. Uh, you know, they, they are more heavily policed. And one other thing I would say, I mentioned tenants with disabilities. And I don't know if I'm getting too far afield right now, but there's a lot of talk now about the fact that problems arise when uh, police are called to situations involving uh, people with disabilities and mental health issues. And maybe it's it's too tangentially related, but I think that um, is an important issue too, that there has they have to think of another way to respond to a lot of those situations, not to respond to them just with uh, deadly force. Thank you. Um, okay, so if any, we, we have a, just a few more minutes before we'll have to wrap up our panel. So anybody out there who wants to ask a question, you can either raise your Zoom hand or you can type it into the chat. Uh, uh, and I, I guess I wanted to just say, say a little bit about my um, sources of optimism cur currently is, it, it, it seems to me that there are a lot more conversations around housing than there have been at any prior time that I can recall in my life. Um, it, it seems as if it's really starting to be a much more of a, of a front burner kind of issue. Um, and I, I'm not sure exactly, maybe you all have ideas of to what we would attribute that, but I think it's a mix of factors. Uh, I think there's starting to be a lot more awareness of kind of the history of how our neighborhoods ended up the way that they are, that, that it wasn't just sort of, uh, you know, sort of free choice or, or, or whatever, that, that, uh, that there are these entrenched patterns and there's intentional governmental discrimination behind it, as well as private discrimination, and that that long history has shaped the way that our communities are now. Um, it, it seems as if there's starting to be some pushback against this idea of single family home zoning being the only way to go. Um, and so that seems like a, a margin on which there's starting to be a shift in opinion that, uh, that maybe just even several years ago or a decade ago or something would, would have seemed kind of um, impossible that, that that could be touched. So I, I, I guess I, I'm, um, I feel optimism from those dimensions. Um, I guess the one thing that I, that I, that I wonder about, and maybe someone on the panel would speak to this is kind of about the mix of you know what what's the right mix of place based um, versus person based sort, sorts of strategies to what extent should we be and I guess the affordable um, requirements ordinance is one one locus for thinking about these tensions because if I, if I understand it I don't I don't know the most recent version so um, I may be getting the details wrong but uh, as I understand it developers can actually pay rather than put in affordable units. And that has a very different kind of implication in terms of actually mixing in affordable units versus money that would go, I guess, somewhere else. Um, so any, any thoughts on that? I'd love to say quickly, I think that we really need to talk to the families most directly impacted by this. And that for many, the voucher program um, has a lot of opportunity for them to have to have a more freedom over their housing choices. The problem is, as Larry and Lolly have pointed out, there's all these other discriminatory and artificial barriers that are really undercutting that freedom of choice. And so if we could improve upon that program, um, outlaw at the federal level source of income discrimination and sort of deal with the other barriers around that like credit and rental history and eviction filings and criminal records. It, it is something that when I talk to families and the clients I've had over the years that they want, I think you still need the mix of place-based solutions. Um, and, uh, and that's why it's important to focus on it now given the likelihood of a, of a real ramp up in affordable housing production um, over the next four years. 
and, and really enforcing those fair housing principles on those place-based opportunities. Thank you. So I think we have just about one minute left. If anybody has any um, parting thoughts that they would like to share uh, about where to, where to go forward. And I, and I guess another issue is if, if people out in the audience are interested in, um, in getting involved in some way or learning more, um, are, are, there, are there particular organizations that you would recommend that they connect with or, or thoughts that you would have about what they could do? We're always seeking donations. <laughs> to further our work and we promise we'll uh, address fair housing issues. Again, I come to this as a storyteller and um, I, I've populated the chat with a bunch of stories that give some information. But what I would say is be a part of the conversation. Um, and, and we talked about earlier about what we could do to put pressure on aldermen and on the mayor. And that is to raise fair housing, equal access to housing and housing choice as a conversation and as an election piece to all to all elected officials and people who are running for office. You should not be able to run for office, particularly in the city of Chicago, without having a conversation about equal access to housing. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thanks to all of our panelists for a, a really tremendous panel. Um, I've learned a lot. This, this has been terrific. So, so thank you. Um,